Okay, and on to our reading for today. We are on a new book to match our new month. It's Friday the 1st of May today, and we are reading chapter two, which is called Strange Meetings. It was, I was still deciding which direction to take when I heard a voice from behind me. Who are you? What do you want? I turned. Who are you? She asked again. The old lady who stood before me was no bigger than I was. She scrutinised me from under the shadow of her dripping straw hat. She had piercing dark eyes that, did not, that I did not want to look into. I didn't think it would rain, she said, her voice gentler. Lost, are you? I said nothing. She had a dog on a leash at her side, a big dog. There was an ominous growl in his throat and his hackles were up all along his back. She smiled. The dog says you're on private property, she went on, pointing her stick at me accusingly. She edged aside my raincoat with the end of her stick. Went away from that school, did you? Well, if it's anything like it used to be, I can't say I blame you. But we can't just stand here in the rain, can we? You'd better come inside. We'll give him some tea, shall we, Jack? Don't you worry about Jack. He's all bark and no bite. Looking at Jack, I found that hard to believe. I don't know why, but I never for one moment thought of running off. I often wondered later why I went with her so readily. I think it was because she expected me to, willed me to somehow. I followed the old lady and her dog up to the house, which was huge, as huge as my school. It looked as if it had grown out of the ground. There was hardly a brick or a stone or a tile to be seen. The entire building was smothered in red creeper, and there were a dozen ivy-clad chimneys sprouting skywards from the roof. We sat down to close the stove uh, we sat down close to the stove in a vast vaulted kitchen. The kitchen's always the warmest place, she said, opening the oven door. We'll have you dry in no time. Scones? She went on, bending down with some difficulty and reaching inside. I always have scones on a Sunday. And tea to wash it down. All right for you. She went on, chatting away as she busied herself with the kettle and the teapot. The dog eyed me all the while from his basket unblinking. I was just thinking, she said, you'll be the first young man I've had inside this house since Bertie. She was silent for a while. The smell of, of the scones wafted through the kitchen. I ate three before I even touched my tea. They were sweet, crumbly and succulent with melting butter. She talked on merrily again to me, to the dog. I wasn't sure which. I was really, I wasn't really listening. I was looking out of the window behind her. The sun was bursting through the clouds and lighting the hillside. A perfect rainbow arched through the sky, but miraculous though it was, it wasn't the rainbow that fascinated me. Somehow the clouds were, were casting a strange shadow over the hillside, a shadow the shape of a lion, roaring like the one over the archway. Sun's come out, said the old lady, offering me another scone. I took it eagerly. Always does, you know. It may be difficult to remember sometimes, but there's always sun behind the clouds, and the clouds do go in the end. Honestly. She watched me eat, and a smile on her face that wa warmed me to the bone. Don't think I want you to go, because I don't. Nice to see a boy eat so well. Nice to have the company. But all the same, I'd better get you back to your school after you've had your tea, hadn't I? You'll only be in trouble otherwise. Mustn't run off, you know. You've got to stick it out, see things through. Do what's got to be done, no matter what. She was looking out of the window as she spoke. My Bertie taught me that, bless him. Or maybe I taught him. I can't remember. And she went on talking and talking, but my mind was elsewhere again. The lion on the hillside was still there, but now he was blue and shimmering in the sunlight. It was as if he were breathing, as if he were alive. It wasn't a shadow any more. No shadow is blue. No, you're not seeing things, the old lady whispered. It's not magic. He's real enough. He's our lion. Bertie's and mine. He's our butterfly lion. What do you mean? I asked. She looked at me long and hard. I'll tell you if you like, she said. Would you like to know? Would you really like to know? I nodded. 
Have another scone first and another cup of tea. Then I'll take you to Africa where our lion came from. Where my Bertie came from too. Bit of a story I can tell you. Have you ever been to Africa? No, I replied. Well, you're going, she said. We're both going. Suddenly, I wasn't hungry anymore. All I wanted now was to hear her story. She sat back in her chair, gazing out of the window. She told it slowly, thinking before each sentence. And all the while, she never took her eyes off the butterfly lion. And neither did I. Okay, so that's chapter one. Our five quick fire round questions are, what do you think the word ominous means on page 10? Question two, who is Jack? How do we know this? Question three, can you describe the house in one sentence? Use the pages on pages 10 and 12 to help. Question four, write three adjectives used to describe the scones. And question five, the boy describes the lion on the hillside as blue and shimmering. Can you remember what other animal he described like this earlier in the book? See if you can remember that. You would have read that yesterday. Stems. Pause it while you have a go. Okay, your answers. I think the word ominous means threatening or warning, okay? So it was Jack the dog who, was, who had an ominous growl in his throat meant that he kept, perhaps came across as a little bit threatening or he was warning the boy away from the old lady. Who knows? Who is Jack and how do we know? Jack is the old lady's dog. We know this because she talks to him, calling him Jack, and tells the young boy he is all bark and no bite. Okay. Can you describe the house in one sentence? That is completely up to you. Okay, but you should have used the ideas from page 10 and page 12 to help you with that. Okay, so we'll look forward to seeing those. Right, the three adjectives used to describe the scones. We've got sweet, crumbly and succulent. And then the boy describes the lion. He described the butterfly lion as blue and shimmering earlier in the book on page four. He describes the lion this time, not the butterfly lion. Question six. Can you write a physical description of the old lady using what we're told about her in this chapter? You can use page nine and ten to help you. Okay, you do this in your own words, but read through your work to check it makes sense. Question seven. When the old lady said, it may be difficult to remember sometimes, but there's always sun behind the clouds. And the clouds do go in the end, honestly. On page 14. Do you think she's just talking about the weather? What else might she be talking about? Okay, and question eight, using your prediction skills, who do you think Bertie might be? Okay, pause this video and have a go. Okay, writing a physical description of the old lady, there's no right or wrong answer again because it's what you're writing, it's your ideas, but there are some bits in the text that we can pick out quite easily that you could incorporate and use for your answer. So, what do we know? She was old. She was no, when it says she was no bigger than I was. So we take from that, excuse my writing, that she is quite small, okay? That she's quite small. She scrutinised me from under the shadow of her dripping straw hat. Remember, it's a physical description. So it's something, it's about how she actually looks. Okay, so she's wearing a straw hat. We know that. She had piercing dark eyes. I like that. Piercing dark eyes. That's really descriptive that I did not want to look into. That perhaps gives us the impression that she's a little bit scary. Um, let's see what else. She had a dog on a leash. Okay, a leash is another word for a lead. And it was a big dog. Um, we've got, oh, we haven't already underlined. She went on pointing her stick at me. So we know she's got a stick. Okay. And I think on those pages... That is all of the physical description that we've got of her. Okay. When the old lady said it may be difficult to remember, here, so start in here and end in here. So we've got that bit there. 
Do you think? It may be difficult to remember sometimes, but there's always sun behind the clouds and the clouds do go in the end. Do we think she's just talking about the weather? No, you're right. I think she's talking about life as well. Okay. Because I think using this, she's also talking about in life, it's difficult to remember sometimes. There's always good things about to happen. Okay. So even if you're going through a really bad time in your life, okay, there's always something to look forward to or better times that are going to come along. And she uses that. She describes that the clouds do go in the end. So sometimes clouds come along, so bad things come along, but they do go in the end and the sun comes out. So the good things shine through. And she says, honestly. So she's trying to teach him a lesson, I think, here. And relating that back to the book, we know that he doesn't like his school. I think she's saying, stick it out, okay? It might be difficult sometimes at that school, but better times will come, okay? The bad times will go and better times will come just stick with it and then question eight using your prediction skills who do you think Bertie might be okay so again there's no answer for this when I first read the book I didn't know okay I didn't know who Bertie was I wasn't sure from what she'd said so it's really just a stab in the dark a guess okay who is your gut telling you at this point Bertie might be okay do you think he's a friend do you think he's a son do you think he's a husband do you think he's an animal whatever your prediction is that's absolutely fine okay let's just have a quick look at what she says about Bertie she said Bertie's and mine okay so he's our lion um what else do we find out about him Bertie came from Africa we know that um that's all we know really we know Bertie came from Africa and that the lion came from Africa and that the lion is Bertie and the ladies we also don't know the name of the lady yet do we maybe we'll find that out tomorrow well done guys today hi class four I hope you're all okay and found yesterday's learning uh, for maths okay um, I'm going to go through the answers now for the do it and the secure it all right so Number one, you should have got that the time was 18 minutes past 12. You can see that the hour hand has just gone past the 12 and the minute hand is one quarter past, 16 minutes past, 17 minutes past, 18 minutes past, okay? Number two, it was 14 minutes to three because it's just one past quarter two, so it's 14 minutes to and the hour hand is just coming to the three. Number three, it was four minutes to five because you've got your hour hand pointing to your five and the minute hand here is just one after the five two, okay? Number four was three minutes past 11. Now this was a bit hard because you couldn't see the 11 but hopefully you could see that that black dot there was slightly darker. And then if you counted one, two, three, four past o'clock, it was four, sorry, three minutes past 11. Number five was 24 minutes past nine. And finally, number six was 28 minutes to 11. Okay, those of you who got onto the Do It Extra Challenge, you have to use either a clock to show the following times or draw a clock face. So the first one was three minutes past four. So your clock should have looked something like this. The hour hand had gone just past the four and the three minutes we've got should have counted from your clock so one two and three and your minute hand should be pointing there number two was 22 minutes to eight so it should have looked something like this your minute hand it should have gone 25 minutes to 24 minutes to 23 minutes to 22 minutes to and it's two eight so your hour hand is also just there coming up to the eight and finally, you had to do 29 minutes past six. And that should have looked like this. It was the minute hand should have been at the one just before the half past. And your hour hand just past the six coming up to the seven. Okay. Then finally, for your secure it, it asked you true or false. 
at nine minutes past 11, the minute hand is pointing between the 12 and the one. Explain why. Now, I would have suggested that you drew this time out or maybe looked at it with a clock and it should have looked something like this. And you would have found then that it was false because it actually sits between the one and the two because it's here. Okay. So if you explain that along those lines, that is correct. If you're sat there confused by anything I've just said about the do it, the extra challenge or the secure it, please feel free to email me because I'm more than happy to go over it with you again. Because time is really hard, guys, and not being in the classroom, being able to practically explore it, I understand that it's really, really hard. Uh, the fact that you're giving this a go at home makes me so proud because this is tough, okay? So today we're going to look at exploring digital clocks and we're going to look at AM and PM, okay? So when we first looked at time the other day, we decided that each number represented five minutes on the clock, okay? So we count in five. So let's just do that again. So we've got 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, or we can call it a clock, okay? So digital clocks, they have an hour and a minute display and they are separated by a colon. So by these here, guys, okay? Oh, that's a bit dark. So by these two dots, all right? The hours will always be before the colon and the minutes are always after. That's really important to remember. Okay, so the first thing I want us to do is have a look at these two digital clocks. Do these two clocks show the same time? Okay, I want you to think about that. Jot it down if you want to. Do you think they show the same time? What is different about them? Okay, so the answer is yes, they are both showing the same time. They've just shown it in different ways. One has put a zero here to show that there's zero hours in this box. And the other one has just left it blank. That is fine. They're both saying the same thing. Because sometimes on the hour side, which if you remember is before the colons, there is just one digit. Other times there's two. But always when it comes to the minute, there must always be two. So if that was five minutes, that would have to be a zero. Okay, guys? Okay guys, so we're going to have a go at converting from this analog clock here to this digital clock here. We're going to do this one together and then I'm going to give you guys a chance to have a go yourselves. So the first thing we need to do is we need to put in the same hour as on the clock. Now the trick for this is it's always the hour that is sitting slightly before the arrow or the arrow is pointing directly at. Okay, so in this instance it is two. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the minute. So we need to count round the minutes in five. So we've got five, 10, 15, 20, 25, and it's pointing to 30. So we're gonna put our 30 there. So this analog clock is showing 2.30. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Okay guys, so I'd like you to have a go at this one yourselves. What time is the clock showing? I want you to have a go at writing it digitally. So we can all know that it's quarter to five, but how are we going to write that digitally? Okay, hopefully you've all had a go. So we'll have a look here. The arrow is pointing here, but the number before is four. So hopefully everyone put a four there. Then if we counted round, we've got five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45. So hopefully we all put 445. Okay, I hope you're feeling a little bit more confident. Let's have a go at another one. So I'm not going to say anything. You are going to tell me what this is digitally. So pause me if you need to and then come back when you're ready. Okay. Hopefully, we have all recognised that the hour before our arrow is 10. So we have put a 10 in there. And our arrow is pointing directly at the 50. So it's 10.50 or 10 to 11. Okay? 
hopefully we've all got that. If you haven't, go back to the first um, part where I was talking about it, re-go over it and just check that you're definitely understanding it. Right, I want you to have a go now. You can do it in your heads or in your books at matching the analogue clock to the time. So if we call this clock A, this one B and this one C, you can pause me now and then come back when you're ready to go through the answers. Okay, so if we have a look first at this one, the arrow is pointing here, so we're looking at 10. Oh, looks like this is going to be it, but let's just check to be sure. We've got 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. Yep, 10, 35. So hopefully you've matched that up. Our next one. The hour, um, yeah, the hour hand is here, so the hour we're going to be looking at is 12. Ooh. And then just to check, we've got that. We've got 5, 10, 15, 20, 12, 20. Perfect, those match up. And then we've got a 213 here. Is that correct? Yeah, we're pointing directly at the 2 this time. And our hour's gone 10, 15, so we'll count back 14, 13. And that goes there. Okay. Okay, so when we use digital clocks, we talk about AM and PM. Now, I'm sure you've heard of them before, but just to be sure, AM, its Latin name is ante meridian, but we call it before midday, and by midday, I mean 12 o'clock. Okay, and PM is short for post meridian or after midday. Okay, so AM is your morning. And PM is your afternoon. Okay, so anything from sort of midnight to 11.59 a.m. is the morning. And then anything from 12 p.m., so middle of the day to midnight or just before midnight, 12.59 p.m. is the afternoon. So have a look at these times. We've got 8.05 p.m., 10.30 a.m., 11.20 a.m. and 10.50 p.m. Are these times in order from earliest to latest, okay? Pause me while you think about it. If you think it's false, can you put them in the right order? Or if you think they're correct, great, come back and we'll discuss it. Okay, hopefully everyone decided that these times were not Okay, so I'm hoping that everyone decided that was false because we've just talked about the fact that AM means the morning and PM means the afternoon. So a PM would not come before an AM. So if you've corrected it, it should look something like 10.30 AM, 11.20 AM, 8.05 PM, 10.50 PM. Okay? Okay, your final challenge before you do it is I'd like you to write the digital time to match the analog clocks, but I want you to include whether it's AM or PM, okay? So digital, and then you write AM or PM, okay? Good luck, pause me, and then come back when you're ready. Okay, so hopefully, for the first one, we looked at where our arrow was pointing, here. So the hour before it was eight, so we're gonna put 08. Okay, and then if we count in our five to see where we're up to, we're at 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. So we would have put 08, 40, and it says it's in the morning, so we should have written AM. Okay, and for this one, we've got our arrows there, so we're looking at the hour before, it's 1, so we'll put our 01. And we'll count on from our 40 where we just were to 45. So it was 0145 in the afternoon. So we should have written PM. Okay, guys. Hope that makes sense. Okay, I'm just going to tell you in a really quick, easy way that I remember AM and PM. So I always think AM is at morning and PM is past morning. All right. Not sure if that helps at all, guys, but that's just an easy way that I've always used to remember it. Okay, so for your do it today, number one asks you to sort the times from latest to earliest. So what's the latest time and what's the earliest time? Put them in order. 
Question two, you've got two clocks and you need to write the digital time and you need to include AM or PM. And for number three, you've got to match the clock to the most appropriate activity. So you've got going to school, having lunch, waking up, and then you've got 7.05 AM, 5 past 12 PM and 8.25 AM. All right. Oh, yeah. OK, so good luck with those. Any problems, just email me and just have a go. All right, guys. OK, and then finally, for your security today, Steph's bus arrives at the station at 11.25 a.m. Ben's bus arrives at 3.45 p.m. Steph says, my bus arrives after Ben's because 11 comes after 3. Is Steph correct? Explain how you know. OK, try and put as much detail as you can into your explanation. Any problem, send me an email. Good luck, guys. I'll be going through the answers with you on Monday. Have a fab weekend and I'll speak to you on Monday. OK, bye. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to your writing session for today. Um, it's Friday the 1st of May, so we're going to start like we always do with that speech spotter this week. Remember, we're focusing on verbs and nouns and adjectives and adverbs. Um, you're going to write out these sentences for me and you're going to label the noun, the adjective, the verb and the adverb in each sentence. We've been doing this all week, so hopefully this is something you're really familiar with by the time you get to this point. Our first sentence is Reggie found colourful trainers at the sports store. And our second sentence today is Lucy and Benji played nicely with the friendly puppy. Um, see if you can spot the nouns, the adjectives, the verbs and the adverbs in each sentence. Pause the video, write them down and then come back to me for the answers. Good luck, guys. OK, I wonder if you spotted them. I filled them with nouns, verbs, adjectives and adverbs this today. Um, so hopefully you found loads and loads of them. So first sentence, Reggie found colourful trainers at the sports store. Uh, the names of the things, the nouns are Reggie and trainers and sports store being one of those noun phrases that we talked about a little bit about yesterday. OK, what did it happen in the sentence? What was the action? He found some trainers. Um, so our verb is found. What did the trainers look like? Our adjective, therefore, is colourful. OK, so hopefully you did really well with that one. Let's have a look at the second one. Lucy and Benji played nicely with the friendly puppy. So again, we've got three nouns in the sentence. We've got two names of people, proper nouns, Lucy and Benji. And then we've got the name here of the dog. So there's a puppy involved as well. What were they doing? Our verb in the sentence was played. OK, how did they play? Our adverb, nicely. And are we describing something here? We're describing the puppy so it's friendly. Now, I wonder how many people actually looked at this, saw the L-Y on the end and put it down as an adverb, but it's actually describing the noun in this sentence. It's describing the puppy, so it's an adjective in this sentence, not a noun. But it could say, Lucy and Benji played friendly, and that would make it an adverb. So it depends where in the sentence and what it's being used to describe. But that was a bit of a tricky one. So well done if you managed to catch that the friendly puppy, the friendly was an adjective in that sentence. Well done. So today, as part of our learning, we are finishing off our story. So we wrote our introductions on Wednesday. We wrote a main body of our um, stories yesterday. And we're now focusing on that story ending. So what I'd like you to do while I'm just reading out the story ending to you is to have a little think for me. As a reader, are you satisfied with this ending? Are you happy that it's finished or your loose ends are tied up um, and the right thing has happened? Um, and then I want you to think about why you might feel that way. OK, so let's read the end of Fantastic Mr Fox. Outside the fox's hole, Boggis and Bunce and Bean sat beside their tents with their guns on their laps. It was beginning to rain. Water was trickling down the necks of the three men and into their shoes. It won't stay down there much longer, Boggis said. The brute must be famished, Bunce said. The cheering that followed this speech went on for many minutes. OK, so thinking about that, are you satisfied with that ending as a reader? Hey, why do you think you're satisfied with that as the ending? Okay, I'm satisfied with it as an ending, mostly because the mean farmers, the farmers who have been our villains all the way through this story, one, they're a little bit foolish, they're being sat, they're sat out there in the rain um, while the animals are partying here underneath, look, which makes me feel happy because these have won and these have not. 
one thing that really stood out to me when I was thinking about whether I was satisfied with this was how miserable the farmers must have been when it says water was trickling down the necks of the three men and into their shoes. It sounds like a horrible place for them to be while the others are having a party underneath. So it's really important as a reader that we tie up all those loose ends and we make sure our heroes win the day and our villains are left feeling a little bit silly, which is exactly what we're going to try and do in our own adventure story endings today. So, so far we've wrote we've written and um, told the story so far. So we've met our characters, my lark and Mrs. Bates the farmer, and we've gone through the farmer's field, the cornfields and the berry bushes. We've set the trap with the scarecrow, that didn't work. We've set a trap with a net on the bush, that didn't work. And we've got to the point in my story where the net's on the tree and the children are hungry. So today we're focusing on writing this last section, this yellow section down here. And we're going to think about how the hero can win the day and make that villain, Mrs. Bates in my story, look a little bit foolish. Um, so we're gonna have a go at writing this together. And then we're going to have a go at you writing yours. So let's have a start of writing this one. Okay, so here we are with some writing. So I've started it off with where we were at the end of the previous section. So the larks, bored, hungry and sad, were feeling, were feeling terribly, one of our adverbs, glum. They, mm, what can I put next? The larks, bored, hungry and sad, were feeling terribly glum. Okay, so, um, oh, I'm going to delete that and also when suddenly, because it starts some excitement for my reader, Mr. Lark had a brilliantly fantastic idea. I'm going to put an exclamation mark because it was an absolutely brilliant idea and I wanted that to stand out for the reader. Had a brilliantly fantastic idea. If only the larks could peck their way through the net, then they would be able to eat again and wouldn't feel so hungry. Okay, brilliant. So now I need to get them to nibble and peck their way through. So I'm going to start a new paragraph here because I've started a new activity. So together, the larks, the lark family, and I'm going to try and do a list because I think that will make it sound more exciting, nibbled, pecked and clawed at the strong net until they made a tiny little hole, okay? From the hole, the littlest lark, littlest lark, wiggled through to the other side of the net. He was free. Okay, so let's have a little read through and see if that's worked as the starting point to my ending of my story. So I've got my family and we've just made the peck the little hole and we're going to make that hole a bit bigger and then I'm going to go um, on to Mr. Lark sneaking out in the night times. But let's see if this bit works first. So the larks, bored, hungry and sad, were feeling terribly glum when suddenly Mr. Lark had a brilliantly fantastic idea. If only the larks could peck their way through the net, then they wouldn't be able to eat again and they wouldn't feel so hungry. Oh, I don't think I like that bit. If only the larks could peck their way through the net, then they, I'm going to put, would never go hungry again. Hungry again. Together, the lark family nibbled, picked and clawed at the strong net until they made a tiny little hole. From the little hole, the littlest lark wiggled through to the other side of the net. He was free. Yeah, I quite like that. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to go on to next how at night time they made the hole bigger um, and then so I might put something like by the night by night time the hole the hole was big enough for the entire lark family to slip out from under the tree 
or notice. Okay. Right, I'm going to leave it there. Okay. So back to your story today. We've already talked about what my story is going to go like, um, but you need to go back to your plan and have a think about what your story is going to look like now because you're going to do that last part of the paragraph. So your challenge today is first of all to reread your story so far. Make sure that it all makes sense and it links well together. So the bits that you wrote on Wednesday and on Thursday all make sense as one. Make any changes that you need so that it really enthralls and engages that reader so that you've got all of those skills in place. And then write your final paragraph. So everybody's going to be writing that final bit today. It's important that the reader is happy with your ending, remember. You tie up all those loose ends and that villain's left feeling a little foolish. If you want that extra challenge, remember to think about the author tricks and tips that you can use to really enthrall the reader and see, make sure your reader enjoyed reading your story. So we're going to pause now so you can write your final paragraph. doesn't need to be very long, maybe five, six sentences at most. Okay, and then come back to me so we can go through it. Okay, brilliant. I hope you really enjoyed writing the end of your paragraph. I hope you've got a really satisfying ending and your reader's really happy with that. But if you do want to double check, make sure that you read that story from start to finish now, all of the parts that we've done. Did you enjoy your story? Did somebody else enjoy your story if someone else is available to read it? Which parts did they really like? What engaged them? And why do you think they might have been engaged with it? Just how you can have a little think before you send it through. Okay, if you have written one of those stories this week, we'd love to hear from you. Um, you can take a photograph of it. If you've typed it up, brilliant. If it's you talking through and explaining your story and video it, that's great. Anything that you've got that you want to share with us, you are more than welcome to, but you don't have to. Um, our email address is for Miss Cunnington is year three at redbrookhays.staffs.fch.uk and for Miss Foster, it's year four at redbrookhays.staffs.fch.uk and I know that would be really, really super excited to see your stories this week. Okay, so final lesson for this week then is our connected curriculum session. This is the last one on the water cycle. So if you haven't done anything yet, this might be the day that you want to have a little look at it. Remember, there's that essential activity with the videos on that you can find out just about the water cycle. It's just a watch and a read and a listen one. So if you want to do something a little bit, then that's the one to do. And if you're really excited by the water cycle and you want to find out more or show us what you learnt, um, then by all means, have a look at the challenges within your um, work pack. Um, and that will give you all the information on the, the science experiment, the poster activity, the imagining you're a water droplet and the video activity are all explained in your work pack. Um, so by all means, go and have a go and see what you can come up with. Um, we're really excited to see how you've got on this week. And then we've got another Connected Curriculum Challenge coming for you for next week. Have a wonderful, wonderful end of the day. Uh, enjoy your weekend and we'll be back on Monday with more learning for you. Bye, guys.